Stanford University. Hello, my name is Natalie Marine Street, and I'm with the Stanford Historical Society's Oral History Program. The Stanford Historical Society was founded in 1976 by Stanford staff, faculty, and alumni who had a desire to preserve the history of this unique institution. In the late 1970s, the Society launched an oral history program in order to gather the memories and Stanford experiences of people in the Stanford community. Since that time, through the efforts of volunteers, the program has gathered more than 300 oral histories of Stanford faculty, staff, and alumni. Today, February 2nd, 2016, I'm very happy to be here with Professor Albert Makovsky, the Canon USA Professor of Engineering. Professor Makovsky came to Stanford in 1960. He was an expert in television systems at RCA and worked at the Brooklyn Polytechnic Institute, and he came to work at the Stanford Research Institute. He obtained his PhD at Stanford through the Honors Co-op Program, and in the early 1970s, he changed his research focus to the field of medical imaging. He joined the Stanford faculty in the early 1970s with a unique joint appointment in the Department of Electrical Engineering and the School of Medicine's Department of Radiology. He and his team have made significant advances in medical imaging, in X-ray imaging, ultrasonic imaging, magnetic resonance imaging, and computerized axial tomography. We are very pleased to be here today. Thank you so much, Professor Makovsky, for joining us today. Well, thank you very much, Natalie. I'm deeply honored to be added to the very distinguished list of people who have had their oral history recorded. I was very impressed with the people. Yes. Well, thanks for joining us. And we want to start out at the beginning. And I just would love you to tell us a little bit about when and where you were born and something about the circumstances of your early life. Well, my parents were both immigrants. They both came from Poland. M mostly the World War I motivated <coughs> their escape from Poland. My father was a teenager and was <coughs> about to be drafted into the Russian army, mm -hmm. and <coughs> he escaped. He traveled all around Europe. He was very adventurous. He ended up in Canada. And then one fine day, he lived in Montreal a while, and then one fine day he snuck across the border to the United States. And sometime in the mid-1920s, an amnesty was declared. If anyone was in the country illegally, would they come forth and they would be made a citizen? So he did that, and his citizenship papers says, method of entering country says, by foot. Oh, interesting. And my mother... Uh, was caught in World War I. Her father had already come to the U.S. and was preparing to bring his large family of seven children over, and they were trapped by World War I. And so at the end of World War I, they all left and, and came to this country, settled in New York City, and they met at a uh, night school English class. In fact, we even have a photo of the two of them at different parts of the class no where they kidding. had met. So this is in the 1920s in yes, New York City. right. And uh, I came on the scene in 1929 uh, when I was born, and we lived in very modest circumstances in the Bronx. Actually, throughout our my whole upbringing, <clears throat> we never lived in more than a one-bedroom apartment, even when we had three generations in a one-bedroom apartment. With My brother and I slept in the living room, my parents slept in the bedroom, and my grandmother opened a cot in the kitchen at night. Oh boy. So it, it, was, it was difficult, but we weren't aware of any difficulty. And uh, it, it, it was very gratifying to, to grow up under those circumstances. Yeah. Now tell me about what kind of work your parents did. My father was a jeweler. He made handmade jewelry, and my mother was always a housewife. I mean, she did, had some small jobs before she got married, but after that she was just a housewife. Yeah. I shouldn't say just. 
So he was a jeweler. Did he work in a, a, a shop or a factory? He worked or? in a in a in a shop. Uh, he was pretty good at what he did. So he tended to do what they called special order work. If someone had a a diamond from uh, that would be handed down generations from a great grandparent, he would make a modern setting for it, and so it would still have the emotional value and 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 be attractive. Right. Tell me a little bit about what you did as a kid in New York City. Well, we used to play games in schoolyards and in vacant lots. And then, of course, at, at the age of five or six, I started elementary school. And I did pretty well. It was fairly common if students did well in New York City to skip them. So I skipped a few grades. And uh, that became somewhat of a problem. I, ended up with my peers being somewhat older than myself and I, I always wanted to be able to play ball as well as they did and I couldn't so I, I, that was an area of sensitivity. In school I, I got some awards, I got the, the math award and a number of people in elementary school in New York City wanted to go to specialized high schools. There was Bronx High School of Science at Brooklyn Tech and I could have I'm sure I could have gotten into them, but in an effort with peer pressure, mm. I decided to go to a conventional high school, which I was I felt good about, and so I spent all, the, all of those years in a conventional high school, probably where the instruction wasn't quite as sophisticated, but I found myself more comfortable. Also, I was able to walk to the school, whereas if I went to the specialized school, I would need to take public transportation. Our family never had an automobile. Oh. <laughs> we, now, was we your brother there at the school with you as well? He, my brother is a year and a half older, and he was always one year ahead of me in school. And uh, his age was such that he was just eligible for the draft as World War II was ending. I was too young for, for World War II. When it, it came to uh, going to college, my big dream was to be able to leave home. because mm. our apartment was not comfortable. And by the way, while I was while I was going to high school, there was a lot of problems with books and the like. Uh, and we had to, uh, well, in both high school and college, uh, at the end of one semester, I'd have to sell my books mm. to have enough money for the, for the other. And I did a lot of odd jobs. I was a packer at Gimbel's department store, and I, I worked as a driving school instructor just around the t time I was 18, and all kinds of delivery boy stuff and the you like. You were a driving instructor, but your family didn't have an automobile. Right. Well, how did you manage right. that? We, we, we used to drive friends' cars and stuff. Okay. Yeah, that was... Uh, I so, wanted to ask you a question about um, the Great Depression. So this would have, you would have been a, you know, growing up during this. Was this something that was part of your consciousness? Did yes, you feel yes. This? <coughs> you knew you didn't spend money on anything. <coughs> so that was a difficulty. Yeah, there was just n no money around. <coughs> my mother scraped money and, my, and uh, jewelry was a, a luxury. And so there were periods of time where my father was not employed and he in those days, it wasn't called welfare, it was called relief. So he was on relief part of the time. And your mother was trying to scrape up money and you were working part-time jobs? Y yes. To try to make now, w meet. Uh, when I was ready for college, and I was 16 at the time, my big dream was to, to go away from home. And of course, every college required money other than West Point. And West Point had an engineering school. So I figured I'd apply to engineer. So I wrote letters to our governor, was Governor Lehman of New York at the time. And I was told in no uncertain terms that you can't go until you're 17. And so I didn't want to hang around for a year. So I ended up at City College, which meant taking the subway to the college, which wasn't, wasn't a problem. And, uh, so that was a reasonably good experience, although I, 
I would stay at the library for late hours because I wasn't comfortable being in our apartment. Right. Now, were you the first in your family to go to college? No. My brother started and then was interrupted by the Army, and then he, he continued also at City College. But while he was at City College, he also went to Brooklyn Law School and became an attorney. Yeah. Okay. All right. And this was an expectation in your family that you would pursue higher education? Well, you know, that's an interesting question. Uh, my parents were very oriented toward education, but they had no sophistication about education. Mm -hmm. They had no idea. In fact, uh, I didn't even—I practically didn't know the existence of graduate school. Uh, the idea was you went to college, and you looked at college almost as a trade school. And you went for four years, and then you got a job, which which is actually what I did. But uh, just to show you the lack of sophistication, I. Uh, I had told my parents I want to study electrical engineering, and my mother had told her brother, which is my uncle, about that, and he immediately said that that was a terrible decision because mm -hmm. it's very hard to get into the electrician's union. And they were unable to see the distinction between that and a professional engineer. So it, it, it was that kind of thing. But they were very anxious for my brother and I to get as much education as possible, but they didn't have any understanding or sophistication of it. Right. Now, when you look back to that time of your childhood, were there, you were good at math, was there any indication that you had an engineer's future, any kind of things that sparked your interest in engineering? Well, I definitely played with the radio we had, ah. it's fooled around with it, and then I became a, uh, a ham, amateur radio operator w with some crude equipment, and uh, so that, that that was interesting. Uh, the uh, I, I was always interested in electronics and b would repair things and repair things for the neighbors, their radios and the like. So it, it you know it was always always a natural thing for me to do uh, electrical engineering, but there there was a problem. The thing I was interested in mostly was in electronics, and City College had a history of uh, essentially supporting the New York City power industry. And so the first two years that I wor was at City College, I put an enormous amount of effort, which I didn't enjoy at all, and I didn't put a lot of effort. I didn't. Put, had a lot of interest in was motors and generators and coal furnishes mm -hmm. and steam engines and the like. It was the, the power concentration. When I was halfway through, uh, a number of things happened. First of all, they introduced what they called the new curriculum. And these were people coming out of the service who were familiar with radar and the like. And, and so suddenly they had electronics and radio and I wanted to get into it. I was told that no, that you're you're in the old curriculum, and new students will be in the new curriculum. So I ignored their advice, and I just took all the classes under the rationale that if I had all of the credits needed for a new curriculum degree, they would have to hand it to me, right. which they did. So I did. A fortunate decision. Yes, right. yes, and also uh, at that midpoint in was the time I met Addie, and uh, that that, you know, the love of my life, and that w was a significant change. And m m uh, from that point on, my grades were all A, and we found inexpensive ways to enjoy life. We, the, There was a, a stadium at City College called Lewiston Stadium where they had concerts in the evening for 50 cents, so we went to that. And we found a lot of ways to enjoy New York City for no money. <laughs> right. Do you remember exactly how you met her? Yes. There was the the uh, uptown New York City girls' college was called Hunter College. It was all part of the uh, free college system, and they would hold dances. A lot of colleges held dances, and the dances were there was no band or anything. Someone put on a record player in the gym, and that was the dance. And so both myself and my friends and Addie and her friends went to this just one night to this college dance, and that's where we met and danced, and then 65, well, it's more like 67 years later, we married in January, in August of 1950, so the next anniversary will be 66 years. Right. 
Oh, that's wonderful. So I want to talk about World War II a little bit. So yes. this seems like this must have really been in your consciousness as a teenager with the brother off to war and yeah, you getting I to be draft age. Yes, I was involved with another number of aspects of World War II. One was the mayor, LaGuardia at the time, had set up the War Emergency Radio Service, mm -hmm. where people who had amateur radio licenses would take would be on call in case they had to communicate with each other. So periodically we'd establish communication. But the biggest thing I did as a, this was in, in 1944 in high school, they asked if people were in, that people were interested in replacing the servicemen in Upper New York State had worked on farms. <coughs> they were drafted and now the farming industry in Upper New York State, which is huge, was devoid of, of any men. And so they, they offered to let you out of high school fairly early around May and you'd work on the farm for four months and for the entire summer you'd get a hundred dollars. Oh boy. <laughs> and uh, so I, I volunteered to do that and I was put together with a farmer and it was v a very tough four months. Uh, just anecdotally, the farmer happened to be a Pentecostal preacher, so oh. I could, I could, there was a lot of religion associated with it. Oh, a very interesting way yeah. to spend the summer. It's yes, so. So, that, so that was my involvement with, with the war effort. Yeah. One more question before we get into your sure. early work life. Um, what kind of communities were you a part of as a child and growing up in New York City? Was your family sort of your main community or were there no, others? No, it was, it was all the friends and uh, I was given a huge amount of freedom. One of the things that attracted me was the 1939 World's Fair mm. and uh, high school students were given a book of passes, each pass being 10 cents. So I would go on the subway to my, by myself or with friends all the way from the Bronx to Queens where the, and this I was nine and 10, and uh, or t 10 and 11, I guess, and uh, take the subway and I would go mostly to the science exhibits and see the first television and the early, Westinghouse had a robot. And so uh, the 39 fair was very exciting to be, uh, and as I said, I did it a lot with friends. Mm -hmm. So looking back, was that kind of an inspiration then? Yes, very much so, yeah. Interesting. Any other kinds of inspirations from that time in your life that looking back you say, you know, that has really stuck with me or that person? And, and in some ways, in order to do that kind of scientific activity, I had to be somewhat of a loner. Uh, of course, athletics sort of dominated the scene. Everybody went out, and I, I played ball too. I, but at that point, I wasn't very good at it. So, but I would always find time for uh, the science part. Great. So you're at City College. You've met Addie. So now you're studying and getting good grades. Right. What happens right. next? Well, as I said, the, the last two years it was material I was very interested in. We graduated at the end of 1949, and uh, jobs were very scarce. But fortunately, television was the post-war industry. Everyone was excited about it in, in, uh, at that point, at the end of the war. And so RCA Laboratories was given competitive exams. And so I, I got the word that they were giving competitive exams. I took the exam, and I did quite well at it. Uh, in fact, I did so well that there was some concern as to whether or not I was cheating. Uh -huh. So they called me back and they asked me how I arrived at that answer, and I, said, and, I, at the, and I would have to tell them the logic I used. And that, so I got the job there. And that was a, a very exciting time for me. All of a sudden, you know, I used to have be able to do experiments with basically no equipment and suddenly I was totally surrounded by all kinds of uh, wonderful opportunities and very bright people. 
And the, the first project I was put on, w there was a big problem with television in the early days, especially if you were in a weak signal areas. Every time a car would pass or you'd turn an appliance on and off, the picture would bobble. Synchronization. And, and so it, noise immunity was a big thing to, to not have the, picture, have the picture nice and stable, independent of everything going on. And so I thought about it. And uh, I had some ideas, but the general feeling I had is, uh, these guys around me are so bright, surely they would have thought of this. So I must, must be something wrong. So I finally had enough courage to show it to a supervisor, and he suggested I should build it up. And uh, it, it was amazing to me. The idea that I, I was able to invent something that these bright people had never thought of before and so the whole idea that I had some creativity in me was very exciting because it was a very new experience and, uh, and that has carried forth the only excitement of figuring out an alternate way to do something that's preferable and uh, of course in the, in the uh, television business there was a tremendous pressure to keep the costs down so you couldn't just invent something which took a lot of parts you, you had a it, sometimes be able to do a much better job with fewer parts and so that resulted in RCA had these various award systems and I was so I was getting some awards for that uh, early work on the synchronization no noise immune television systems right and were you part of a team there at RCA how was it organized yeah there was a team uh, RCA laboratories is a big place and there was a, t a television team that I participated in. And, and then we started inching toward color. And once we got into color television, that dominated everything else from there on. First of all, there were competitive systems that you had to work on. And then being able to make a practical color home receiver. And so we would work and uh, we would get, uh, they delivered an experimental color receiver <coughs> to our home, <coughs> and that caused tremendous excitement. All the neighbors wanted to see it. Uh -huh. Of course, most of the broadcasts were at night, well, of course, it was all experimental, but that, we enjoyed that. But uh, it, in essence, they were getting a lot of free labor from us. You know, we'd watch it all night, and bleary-eyed, we'd get together in the morning, and what do we have to do different? But what kind of things were they broadcasting? Test patterns, and uh, very often, you know, people singing and dancing, and uh, a, a number of things like that in, in the uh, in the early days. Yeah, just a variety of things. Yeah, it was exciting. <laughs> and was this the blue banana that they right, broadcast? Right, right. They, they, they broadcast a bowl of wax fruit, and. W we would tend to turn the knobs based on what we n expected the color to be. And so everybody was trying to turn the blue banana <laughs> yellow and making everything, all the, all the everything poor. And so that, that was a funny experience. It drove us crazy for a while. Right. But, yeah. And it was a competitive time, right? I mean, there were people other than RCA that Yes, were CBS had their own system that we were competing with. And, uh, you know, worked with a lot of the... Uh, the w well-known people at RCA. Uh, and so was Sarnoff, what, he was the big guy there then? Yeah, Sarnoff used to really scare me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I remember once we had a, a introduced the, the big picture, the 21-inch one, uh, had a b big press conference, and uh, so I was just turning the knobs on ours, and Sarnoff was looking over my shoulder, and I was sh a little kid shaking, and he said, "How come the faces are green?" And oh no! <laughs> yeah, it was very, very. T but he was a, a brilliant businessman. Uh, you know, it wasn't a technical person. But right, right. And more, and uh, also, uh, Zwerk, and uh, now his his main interest in life was a television camera rather than the receiver. So I met him. In fact, I was introduced to him as the inventor of color television. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> no, I think there was a, a apocryphal, but <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he was, a, he was a very nice guy. Okay. Now, during this time, you also decided to go and pursue your master's degree. Is that right? Yes. As I, as I, initially, I had no 
I didn't understand, nor did I have, have any interest in graduate work. But we had moved to a little house in Long Island, and uh, by that time we had our, our two children, and uh, I realized that, you know, my education w was wanting. And so I enrolled in a master's program at the Polytechnic Institute of Brooklyn. I would use, essentially use the Long Island Railroad to go to Brooklyn in the evening. And so I did all, all of the classes in the evening. And I got my master's in three years. And I had some more interesting views of science at that time, much more sophisticated. Uh, and uh, I started thinking a little bit about academia, which would essentially allow me to be more scientific, have more freedom to do things. And so the first thing I did after getting my master's degree and obviously continuing to work at RCA laboratories, uh, I <coughs> taught at the City College Graduate School one course a semester and, and television. It was a graduate course on television. I did that for three years. It, you know, it wasn't continuous. It, it would be uh, either the fall semester or the spring semester. I would teach one, and the following year I would do it again. And after three years of that, I began to th think more seriously about academia and teaching. So even though I did not have a doctorate, Brooklyn Poly was, they looked at the, the patents I had and the publications I had and were willing to take me on as an assistant professor. So in, in, in 1957, yeah. I started uh, work as an assistant professor at Brooklyn Poly and uh, I taught th three classes each semester in various advanced systems theory and electronics and, uh, and you know, that, that worked out quite well uh, I, in order to continue to for us to have the same lifestyle that we had before I had to continue to work one day a week at RCA laboratories I had hoped that I could work one day a week at RCA laboratories and still control my own patents so if I because some of the things I came up with were quite valuable but they said no if they if I wanted to work as a consultant I had to sign a patent agreement I see. so I succumbed so one day a week I worked at RCA laboratories in Princeton and then the other times I was at Brooklyn Poly yeah. and uh, did that f for three years and you know, after a lot of thought, I realized that if I was going to get deep into academia and research pursuits, I needed a doctorate. But I happened to be at one of the rare places where you could get on the faculty without having a doctorate. I was promoted after the three years to associate professor. And then that summer, the f four of us took a trip a out to this wonderful Silicon Valley, and I was interviewed at two places, at Hewlett Packard, because I had done a lot of work in electronic circuitry, and at SRI, and I was given nice offers at both, and I thought the diversity of SRI, now both of them had uh, the option of uh, the Honors Co-op program at Stanford, which was, a, I, I wouldn't have gone to a place that didn't do that, but uh, SRI seemed more interesting, so I became a research engineer at SRI and over the years I was promoted to senior research engineer and then the top is the staff scientist which is the highest level outside of administration so that that worked out pretty well and I enjoyed starting to take courses it was difficult at first but I started to take courses one course a quarter on the honors co-op program right so I want to back up a little bit and just ask you about that transition. So you're working in industry, there's all this equipment, and you're on the front line, and Sarnoff's leaning over your shoulder, and then you go into academia. Um, how was that transition for you? You know, it, it's interesting. They each have their strengths and weaknesses. In industry, 
the facilities are unlimited. If, if I came up with an idea, immediately two technicians would build it up and, and all the equipment you wanted, all the personnel you wanted, but you worked on what they chose you to work on. If color television was the thing, that's what you worked on. In academia, you, you have a lot of freedom as to what you work on. If, if you're interested in it, I started getting interested in ultrasound and various things, and there was no inhibition. You could work on it. However, most of the things you have to do, you, you, your only help was the student that was working with you or your own hands. There was no techni technicians, there wasn't a lot of equipment. It, it, I mean, you could get equipment if you could get a grant, which we did a lot of. But it, it, so it, it, you had in industry, a lot, you had a lot of resources and little freedom, and in, in academia, a lot of freedom and right. limited resources. Right. Interesting. Now, was there any mentors that you had during this time at Brooklyn Polytechnic? Anybody that sort of helped you to figure out what your path was, or that? influenced you in any way? Uh, not so much in Brooklyn Poly. At, at City College, some of the uh, teachers I had toward the last two years in the uh, electronic area, the, the chair of the uh, electrical engineering department at that time in the 40s was a woman. Does that, she was rare, yes. Cecily Froelich. Ah. And I remember uh, one of the things, strange things I was proud of is finding a big era in Fred Terman's radio handbook. Oh my! And letting and contacting them, and they. <laughs> so I, that gave me a feeling of accomplishment. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Our and, own Fred Terman. <laughs> and when you started teaching, I mean, you hadn't really taught before, right? Right, so. except for that one night uh, at City College. But yeah, right. right, serious teaching I hadn't done yeah. before. Did you have a special approach that you used, or I mean, how were you teaching people about these new technologies? I, I usually like to, to make the teaching as, as creative as possible to, to get people to think. And uh, I remember, uh, well this happened somewhat after when I was teaching at Stanford, but I was teaching a communications class. And rather than go through the various blocks that make up a, a radio, a transmitter and receiver, I drew on the board a microphone connected to an antenna, nothing in between, and on the other side an antenna connecting to a loudspeaker. I said, this is a communication system. Then I said, what's wrong with it? And what can you do to, to improve it? And so we slowly built up the, the parts of that make up a radio receiver and a radio transmitter. So that they, I tried to do things like that that would encourage their own creativity. Right. I also taught at Brooklyn Poly, this was a, uh, one of the very early transistor classes. This was still in the 50s. When the, and it was, it, that class was in the evening, and so uh, students would come over who worked at Bell Labs, which was, mm -hmm. of course, the birthplace of the transistor. And uh, they had a very special feeling, with good reason, for the Bell Laboratories, it was an amazing place. But I like to tease, so uh, I would say something about the ma how a transistor is made, and some, some students would say, well, at th this is what we do at the laboratories. And I knew what he was talking about, but I would always say, what laboratories? <laughs> they always call their place the laboratories. Right, <laughs> right. So a lot of the students that you had at Brooklyn Polytechnic were also working yes, in, the, yes. in the industry. Yes, yes. Yeah, they, Brooklyn, they, they almost primarily catered to people who were already in industry and offered evening courses. I mean, day courses too, you know, in the undergraduate, but in the, a lot of the graduate classes were in the evening. I usually taught two undergraduate and one graduate class. Oh, interesting. An interesting time to be in that that's that yes it place was and time. Uh, somehow when you're in it you never realize right. what a huge transition is being is taking place that's right so you decided you want to get a PhD yes but why in the heck California what brought you all the way out well here? I mean we all have sensitivity to the weather and mm. uh, and people in the field of uh, 
electronics and radio and science always talked about the San Francisco Bay Area, that that's where all the actions. And uh, as you know, Fred Terman, after the war, hired a number of people who had made major contributions at radar. Some of them were at originally at MIT, and he, he amazingly brought this talent out here and created the Stanford Electrical Engineering Department, which has been great ever since. Right. And what was Stanford's reputation when you first came out? Were you sort of aware of what was going on? Yes, yes. I, I knew getting a PhD was going to be tough because, uh, you know, it was a, uh, had a tremendous reputation. Okay. I want to dwell on that for a minute. You said you knew it was going to be tough. Um, this must have been a tough time for you. I mean, you've got two young kids, yeah. you're teaching and you're working, and I mean, how did you balance this? It was it was yeah. difficult. Yeah, I don't know if I had any any uh, secret formula, but uh, w one of the one of the big hurdles at, in the electrical engineering department at Stanford is the PhD qualifying exam. Usually, less than half pass, and very often, if they don't pass, they have to go to some other institution to go for their PhD. So uh, I did a lot of studying for that uh, while I was taking, you know, this one class a quarter. And uh, I scored first in the qualifying exam out of about somewhere between 150 and 180 students, I forget. Wow. And I didn't realize how big it was at the time. I felt obviously felt good about it. <coughs> but it put my name in front of the faculty people <clears throat> and so they were aware of who I was <clears throat> and that that worked very well for me. Uh, okay, and we're going to take a quick break now because I have to get some water too. Okay.